as we go forward, and I, and I agree, this is a wonderful reset point and we have to take advantage of this. You get to tell me one legacy practice that you want to see dropped forever from the business. And then you get to tell me one that you want to see adopted very quickly. Again, that little disconnect between vision, tool chess, and practice. Let's drop this and let's grow a practice. How would you do that? I would say without question, the number one thing we need to move away from and the thing we need to adapt as a norm is we need to move away from transacting on GRPs and we need uh, it to become the norm in the industry that we transact on an impression-based model. Yep. It's 2020. Yes. And <laughs> the fact we're not further along on this journey is problematic. Yep. Um, yep. Not only is it necessary as we move to a multi-screen, more audience-based and addressable world, What's interesting and fascinating to me is, generally speaking, I think, unless I'm wrong, both the buy side and the sell side strongly agree that needs to happen. So the question is, how do we use this moment now to accelerate it becoming the norm, which means needing to overcome a series of challenges, um, including uh, legacy mindsets, um, incentive structures, and system constraints, among, among others. But I feel so strongly on this one because if we don't, don't do this, then innovation in the television industry is going to be held back. And the only one that's going to gain from that, the only ones that are going to gain from that are going to be the tech platforms. Yep. So that would be my, my combined answer. I think you're right on. And I think with that, it's one of those things where, you know, clients won't wait. And the way that they're evaluating media from a macro perspective won't wait. And we have the ability to make those innovative shifts. It's overdue. And as you said, it's both a buy sell and a, a, a buy side and sell side imperative. So it needs to be done. But let, let's talk then about other things that are really important to advertisers. You'd mentioned ROI before. Are you finding, you know, right now, 2020, 2021, that if you want a larger share of the ad budget, that attribution and ROI has got to be part of the part of the conversation. Are you finding that more often with clients who aren't talking sp specifically about well executed, but in other words, productive media plans and productive schedules and productive yeah. downs and productive executions. Are you being held uh, in terms of looking at increases in ad budgets to standards about, you know, look, we need to see attribution. We need to see ROI. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say we're not at a point today where it's a prerequisite to see bigger budgets, but it is absolutely a differentiator. And I'd say that over time, yes, I think it will be expected. Um, look, I think delivering improved media efficiency has rightfully taken on, taken on a, a new level of importance uh, for advertisers, and, and I think the pandemic, the pandemic has only exacerbated an already growing trend of demand by marketers for their ad spend to work harder. Um, for companies like Effective uh, and others in the space, it's about solving now for proof of performance at each stage of the purchase funnel, so we're able to get the credit we deserve for bottom of funnel. I think that's critical. And with respect to, you know, you, you have tremendous amount of first party data, you're able to take a look at a lot of different data sets and you understand, you know, lift and performance and things like that. Uh, you're confident going forward that as we get ever into a world of sort of prove it to me economics, and I, I get your point that it's not quite there yet with respect to, you know, qualifying for larger budgets now, but it certainly will be in the future. If for in terms of pushing all the chips in on TV. Are you, you comfortable on multi-screen TV based on the data that you've seen with respect to the effect that you know, your assets could have on overall lift throughout that purchase funnel? Or is that something where you're willing to push all the chips in and say, yeah, measure me that way? Yeah, totally, because the you know, truth's on our side here. Um, yeah. I, really, I really believe it. We just haven't done a good job as an industry proving it. So I feel really, really confident and the data is continuing to prove it out. Um, I think that we're not where we need to be in it in terms of um, proof of performance just being de facto, and it should be. And I think when that happens, you're gonna see a shift of dollars uh, away from bottom of funnel players as the reality of um, 
the value of kind of top and mid funnel uh, comes to fruition. I think on the point on multi-screen, um, just as an example, we actually just finished a study with media science that showed when ads air on TV and digital uh, channels together versus uh, digital alone, we saw a kind of 2x increase in brand recall and 50% increase in, in brand and tech. Um, that's fine. But I think where things get interesting is when you then take a data enabled audience approach and overlay that with multi-screen execution, the ROI increases either, even further. So it's the intersect of the two that's, that's going to be critical. Yeah, agreed. Not only the, not only the instruments, but the ability to manipulate in real time and right. to optimize that that's where they're, where, where it is. And I, I, in a way, I'm not surprised that it's a two X lift because that's consistent with, you know, some of the data that we've seen that or better. Um, are there, you know, you'd mentioned automotive before as being a critical category for, um, you know, some innovation uh, during COVID uh, and, you know, the, the type of work you've been doing with those kind of clients. Are, are there a few categories that are really leaning in that you think are going to help lead the charge with respect to, you know, the, the, the types of data that we've been talking about over the last few minutes or there's some natural categories that you see as, you know, first movers, first innovators, um, automotive, maybe one, a couple others? Yeah, um, autos one, finance, healthcare uh, are others. But honestly, I think it's less category specific. Um, it's more the progressive advertisers who are shifting to more kind of audience-based multi-screen buying. And as part of that, um, that value prop, they are wanting proof of performance. And so it's, it really comes down to sophistication. Um, I will say that, you know, as we talk about top funnel, bottom of funnel arguments, it's interesting because you know, I believe you speak to any, any marketer, I mean, all marketers, I'll say brand building matters in terms of delivering results. Um, marketers know the importance of brand advertising to drive results. We just need to do a better job of proving it. And I think um, one of the best examples here is something that is close to, close to your heart, Sean, and that's looking at the direct consumer companies that were sure. born on social channels. Um, however, it's those that have become breakout success stories, think the, you know, the Pelotons of the world, um, where there becomes a point where those social channels just simply can't provide the reach they need and they run into issues with uh, excess frequency. Um, and you know, based on the conversations I think we both have with those, those companies, Multi-screen television has played an absolutely crucial role in helping them scale and kind of go mass market. And you know, I will I will butcher the, the your own your own stats, but um, you know I, I believe your own research was showing uh, for those that uh, were running TV campaigns, kind of post campaign, the low level of 20, 30 percent lift in website unique visitors, and those that really pushed a lot of dollars into TV, sometimes up to over two hundred percent lift and. Yep. Our work um, within effect has proven the same. We, during COVID, we ran a study with one of our attribution partners, TV Squared, um, where we looked at website lists for clients that stayed on air and those that didn't during uh, the first few months of COVID. Um, advertisers that remained on air experienced a prolonged impact of um, around 20, 23, 25% more website engagement in the subsequent weeks after their um, multi-screen television campaign ran. Um, and those that went off air saw website visits drop by an average of 20%. So, you know, we're scratching the surface, but the, the data is going to prove it out. And I, I believe the low funnel target advertising is of course a valuable part of the overall media mix. There's no question. My point is that it's those lower funnel companies are taking too much credit for the value that middle and upper funnel solutions are driving. And that's just got to change. And I, I think you're, I think you're right on with, with respect to sort of a whole, a whole mind shift. And yeah. because to your point, there are, you know, active, you know, wide scale advertisers that are showing how to work the full funnel at the same time that are showing, you know, the an incredible strength that, you know, activation and lower funnel, but at the same time, even in one creative execution, or building brand, or building loyalty, or you know, or you know, building longer you know term assets and longer term equities. And I, exactly. the key is the data. I mean, what's interesting about listening to what you've been talking about the last few minutes is that it intuitively makes sense to a sophisticated marketer. I think where 
we're going to be in the business of is here are the data proof points that give you the permission to go with instincts that you know have been evolving but this is what you felt has been going like all along here's the data. and i want to i want to pivot another way with the data because um effective comcast your parent company i mean one of the things that you have is extremely unique with respect to how broad the scale of your first party data set is and you know that that's one of the keys to you know making all of the things we've been talking about work and when you're when you're with a a potential client, a prospective client, someone you're not quite doing business with yet. It's a big national client. And you yeah. begin to describe the capabilities inside of that first party viewing set. You know, give us give us a little a little peek under the tent. Is there an aha moment sometimes where, you know, what's possible, you know, really gets sort of a, a raised eyebrow or a neck snap and you say, wait, you can do what? It is with your scale of the kind of first party data you have. Is there a commonality where people are like, tell me more about that? Yeah, look, firstly, as I said earlier in this discussion, um, COVID has created the conditions where um, people, advertisers are leaning in more than ever to understand the data. And so going back to the pivot points, it's meant a kind of acceleration that is great for our business. I would say that generally speaking, a lot of people talk about data as part of their offerings. And it's a word that's thrown around a lot, similar to how the word programmatic is thrown around a lot. Um, the good news is, and, and this is, this is, I think one of the, the aha moments that is continuing to go off with our, with our, our advertisers is there's an increasing understanding that not all data is created equal and uh, the value of deterministic data as the foundation to inform more intelligent campaign planning, optimization, and uh, attribution is far greater than using probabilistic data as the foundation. So you know, what I mean by that is actually knowing, actually knowing how many times any given household has been exposed to a campaign is really different than modeling whether they are likely to be exposed. So using deterministic data as the foundation, in our case, to your point, that means Comcast set top box data. And then on top of that, layering on third party probabilistic data to support our ability to scale our models is an approach that we believe um, is going to differentiate us and help our clients better execute data enabled campaigns. Yeah, well, now, when you're talking about that kind of difference, you know, modeling versus deterministic data. Now, one of the one of the categories that's always been on the cutting edge of using sophisticated first party data sets has been uh, political. And uh, we are in a political year. Um, it, it, it's amazing that that sometimes is the third largest headline in our country, despite everything that's going on. Um, but, you know, uh, from everything you've seen in 2020 so far with the data capabilities you're talking about, do you see from now through the you know end of the election cycle, uh, do you see just the, these tools exploding with respect to the the use that they're going to have from you know from the political sector in the next few months? Yeah, it's a timely question. Um, you know, firstly, what's interesting before talking about data is that despite the impact of COVID on the advertising industry, which has been significant, political as a category we're seeing is remaining resilient um, and kind of understandably so. I think. Um, Recent forecasts are showing uh, actually an increase to about six and a half or more billion dollars in 2020 cycle. Um, and I think we're also going to see a record spend on digital, um, something that you know, we feel really confident with our ability to support based on the scale of multi screen industry we got. But yeah, in terms of data, the political industry is absolutely on the cutting edge. Um, up and down the ballot, we're seeing many more custom match requests from political clients than we did in both 2018 and 2016. And it's resulting in broader and deeper schedules, again, with a focus on audience. And as such, um, the ROI on spend, we think is gonna improve that for our political clients. Um, leaning in in data, though, is also having a secondary impact um, and accelerating a move to multi-screen executions within political advertising um, with the recognition of the growth of kind of streaming TV. And we're seeing significant demand for the targeted OTT inventory for the general election window as buyers look to um, 
uh, have scale uh, across both television and streaming TV channels. That's an area we're focused on. Um, and then finally, I'd say you know, with this OTT inventory, it's a real focus in political um, programmatic execution on that is becoming increasingly important. Um, we're making that, we're making some of our inventory available for purchase through our DSP partners um, on a programmatic guarantee basis. So it's really just great automation. So taking political overall, it's really fascinating because I think it's a bit of a bellwether for what may happen in 2021, uh, in particular with the kind of accelerating use of, uh, use of data.